you to know me and to Hilmar. It's a bit humbling to hear that. Um, I feel a bit responsible now. Um, and uh, and but it was a, it was an incredibly interesting time back then. And I'll come on to the fact that I don't think this um, period. I'm going to start by the fact that saying that we clearly are not out of a job for a very long time as bioinformaticians. But perhaps more importantly, this idea of really properly sharing what we do, both in terms of data and code, is not going away. It's, um, it's really a key thing. I enjoy being part of um, a, a group, a community that shares things, basically. So I've got four sections of my talk. The last one is a lot more fun and irreverent. Um, and the first, the first one is scene setting, and then there's two bits in the middle about which is more kind of, you know, what should we be doing uh, and why open source matters. So I'm just going to start with something that I, I now quite often do, which is remind people what a remarkable decade we've been through and quite likely what it's going to be like again um, over the next uh, decade. So I, this is my, one of my favorite uh, slides that explains genomics to non-genomicists. Um, back in 2000, uh, an American persuaded the US stock market to give him enough money to sequence his own genome. And that cost about 26 million pounds. And that is the same amount of money as the most expensive house in London at the time. And this is a picture actually of a house on the same road. Uh, uh, as that, uh, that house. I don't think you can actually get to that house. These days, well, back in 2013, 2015, it's even more um, ridiculous. So in 2013, it was like a family, to get your genome sequenced, it was like a family season ticket to Arsenal. Now, that's not cheap, um, but many people uh, buy a family season ticket to Arsenal. I think today, um, it is the same cost to sequence your own genome as it is to get a single season ticket to Arsenal. Uh, and in a couple of years' time, or next year, I think it will be West Ham. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a bit harsh. Uh, <laughs> uh, Blackburn Rovers for Carol. Uh, and uh, actually, probably all of us will go and have a family meal, uh, maybe this year, next year, or the year after, say uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving or around that time, you'll have a family meal and you will actually spend more money on that meal than, having your, uh, than what it would cost to have your genome sequenced. Now that's a remarkable cost drop in price. There are very, very few technologies that have dropped that amount in price. Now the reason why these technologies have dropped in price is because of human health. I'll come back to that again perhaps at the end. Um, this is why people have developed these amazing technologies. But, um, as you all know, uh, the stuff that life is made out of, DNA, protein, RNA, is just the same uh, across all of life. Uh, I actually think these technologies are likely to have as much of an impact on the planet via agriculture as they are via human health. Um, and if you're an ecologist, you have suddenly got an entirely new toolkit in which to study the environments that you live in, because you can go and sequence or measure things on, on uh, living organisms. So the scope of what we do, which is to look at the biomolecules of life, is incredibly, incredibly large. And this is why we're sort of all here as well. Um, I actually started out life as a molecular biologist, uh, uh, which is sort of advanced cookery, uh, advanced, very careful cookery. Um, and uh, this is still a, an important part of our science that we do. But at least as much of the science is done here inside of a computer as it is done uh, inside of the wet lab. And uh, we're all part of that. We're part of the people who understand that. But really, we are the, there are not, you know, still, I think, crudely, the ratio of the number of people being trained on this side versus the number of people being trained and coming up on this side is out of whack. We don't have enough geeks um, in the system. So I just want to remind you um, uh, about our, uh, the institute that I now co-direct with Rolf Apfeiler. It's Emble EBI. Um, we're a 
international non-profit research institute. We're part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. That's an international treaty organization. It's a bit like CERN. In fact, its, its creation was came from the same process as CERN. Um, and the EMBL is headquartered in Heidelberg, Germany, and we are based just south of Cambridge, UK. Um, and this is a picture of this. We're Europe's hub for biological data services and research. We have 570 members of staff from 53 nations. We, this is out of date now. We now spin 60 petabytes of disk. We have two 40 gigabit um, uplinks uh, uh, onto the network, and we have uh, a large amount of compute. One of the changes over the last 10 years from when I, from 2000 and uh, when BOSS started, was that when we would go to big data conferences, I would be sometimes the person representing biology. And back in 2001, 2002, 2003, we were at the back of the room as the little people who didn't have a lot of data, whereas the physicists and the astronomers and the oceanographers were at the front of the room uh, being the big boys. Uh, with all the data. And now this is uh, uh, changed over, um, and I'm now invited up to the uh, big boys table, or big boys and girls table, um, uh, uh, to represent bizarrely biology. And it's really the case that our data rates, so the amount of data that the life sciences produces, is not quite as large as the particle physicists, but it is less than an order of magnitude lower. And that's really, we're really seriously in the same bracket of um, uh, data, data rates. To go through the EBI, some of you know us well, some of you don't. Um, we organize data across from genomes all the way down to reactions, interactions, pathways. Um, Naomi mentioned Ensemble, which is where I started. There's also Uniprot, for example. Um, PDBE, the Protein Data Bank, uh, Campbell for Chemical Biology. A big shift over the last five years has been our, our impact in literature. If I encourage you to go and play around with Europe PubMed Central. This is a peer system to PubMed Central, but it's being very innovative under Joe McIntyre, um, where um, uh, things like orchids are integrated into the literature. And the other thing, uh, the other big shift has been the way that we have organized this, where we have abstracted out the information behind the sample information. So both the DNA uh, surveys, the RNA surveys, and the protein, uh, 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 protein um, mass spec surveys use common samples very often. And rather than having that information structured in subtly different ways across all three places, this is abstracted out into one database, uh, which is a biosamples database run by Helen, who I notice is in the audience, Helen Parkinson. So that was an introduction about the whole area and a little bit of an introduction to the EBI. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but I actually wanted to step back and think a little bit about why, why BOSC and why it being open source in particular for code matters. So why, um, you know, does it matter? It's an interesting question. We could, uh, we could just swap executables. We could not even worry. We could, we could just publish data and publish our methods uh, uh, using plain text description. So I'm going to have three reasons why open source code um, uh, matters. So the first one is very, very simple, which is about scientific transparency. So we are scientists. We're trying to work out how the world works. And the key part, the key difference between an alchemist in 1665 and a scientist in 1665 is that a scientist uh, in 1665 wanted to share their knowledge. And they did that through, in fact, this is the, um, whatever it is, the 300th well, anniversary of the year when the first scientific journal was established uh, by the Royal Society. And it was radical because you, people published their data, their analysis, 
and their conclusions for other people to read. And until that point, uh, things were shared in a far more kind of uh, a private way between individuals. So literally, you had to be the apprentice of the person with the knowledge to gain the knowledge going forwards. And this business of being open is really fundamental to science. There is no way that you can be open about your understanding of the world without that kind of transparency. And that transparency goes to your code. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that your source code has to be licensed openly, but it does mean that your source code has to be available. You have to be able to read it. And I find people who don't come up to that standard very counterintuitive. I'm absolutely fine with them, with people not, you know, with Google not necessarily sharing their code base. Um, that's okay, but they're not doing science, they're being a commercial company. If you want to do science, you have to provide transparency uh, to your code. So what's the, the other reason, my, my second reason for um, uh, why one should be use open source licenses? And this is the discovery in the 90s. Um, this is the discovery of Linux, of Apache, of many, many uh, systems, which is actually, it is far, far more efficient to be open source. It's a famous uh, quote from Eric Raymond, who, who advocated this, given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. Uh, the idea there being that everybody who comes and looks at a piece of code sees a different thing. And as we all know, there are going to be bugs and problems that there always are in these things. And so just having a diversity of people looking at the code and fixing it fundamentally produces better code. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a whole business of, of uh, reusing code, actually making code that can be properly reused. There's a real art to it. It is something, it's more than providing your code, it's more than providing the right license. You have to think about the people who are using it. And this means writing good libraries, it means writing things, thinking about what level of ab abstraction. There's, a, there's usually a contract implicitly in this between what does the library do and what does, what, how does somebody use it. And this requires, as, as people know, quite an art to know where you stop. Um, if you've been following Twitter, um, there has been an interesting discussion about this. And one of the things which I think has been, um, uh, which, which that conversation helped me realize, is that it's as much about the small things of open source code as the big things. So a lot of people <coughs> will think, well, the, the major piece of efficiency is that indeed I can you know, call out into a library and that's, that there's going to be some really complicated algorithm down there, which I never want to write myself. Sometimes that happens. But a far simpler thing is by being open source, uh, stupid things like getting it to compile on the latest version of Mac OS 10.9, where the da -da 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 library has gone and been put somewhere else or something like that. All of these kind of really little mini annoyances that produce cumulative a massive massive um, uh, speed bump in trying to get things up to speed, get, get eroded incredibly quickly in, in an open environment. Now, this is a sort of efficiency in terms of making the code. There's actually, I think, something else in science across many um, aspects, which bugs for us are not just annoying. It's not just a kind of, oh my God, the program's crashed and I'm gonna have to restart and stuff like that especially when they're sort of analytical bugs, these are the worst bugs for scientists. So the program runs, it gives you a number. You believe the number is right because you, 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 know, you don't want to worry about it. You don't kind of second guess it from some other direction. And then you work from that number onwards. So you sort of trust, you have to trust that that program is doing the right thing. And when there are analytical bugs, they have profound consequences downstream. Um, and there's some classic problems. There's some classic bugs in Excel, not just the really annoying date, auto date finding system, which obviously, if somebody could work out how to disable permanently, 
um, most of science would be a happier place. Um, uh, but some of their statistical routines are well known not to work in some scenarios. And that's kind of, it's sort of offensive. And one of the things that I recommend when people go to R rather than Excel, I say the thing is, is that a good chunk of the world's statistical community goes and use this. And believe you me, when you call one of these core functions, you can feel confident that if there's a mistake in this, it's a mistake that thousands of professional statisticians are making all at the same time. Um, and so your risk pooling, basically, your trust level in code, you're, we're pooling our risk together. We're m being more efficient at finding problems because they're shallow, but we also, it gives us a level of trust because we do this as a community. And then that comes to the sort of third thing, which is uh, community. And I think BOSC and the BioStar projects and BioPerl and BioPython and all these things, uh, Cytoscape, are, uh, the Bioconductor, are really great examples of this. So I actually didn't manage to. So a, a large amount of science is a team sport. And I have participated in a team sport science for many, many times. And in fact, it's quite frustrating when there's this obsession about finding individuals in the team um, to highlight. And I've been lucky because I have often been an individual that has been highlighted. When in fact, the, the only real way to say this is a bit like a, a, you know, 11 people on the field playing soccer or whatever the right number is for an American football team. You have to give the credit to the entire team. It's not even the coach or anything like that. It's just a gestalt thing. And when we really share code across a large number of us, we allow ourselves to specialize in a way that you cannot achieve when you have to be the person responsible for the kind of end-to-end -end, uh, thing. And this can outlast any individual's contribution to really become a community product. And I should have added um, Cytoscape here, which I think is a, is a fourth really good example of this. And in all of these cases, I know that there have been multiple individuals who've kind of carried the torch at different parts of the time. And more, the, you know, this, it's just assumed that this has, um, that all of these components work. People assume that the guts of Bioconductor won't collapse in two years' time um, uh, uh, because of the community around it. And if we've got a failing in the system here, it is that our funding systems don't really understand how to fund these communities. There's a real weird mismatch, and I'll contrast that to the commercial area around a lot of open source projects. So for example, Linux, where they have really worked out how, well, from the outside, it seems that they have worked out how to fund an ecosystem that goes from volunteer through to he heavily paid professional and keep all of that together. And somehow I think we do need to go back to our hires and betters, and arguably I'm becoming a someone who sits in this, these places and say, look, we need to do this in a, in a way that leverages volunt predominantly volunteer communities, but gives the not only the recognition for that community, but the necessary key spicing of funding so that the whole system propagates forwards over time. So this leads me to a different thing, which is to talk about infrastructure. Just as code can often be forgotten, um, infrastructure is probably the least interesting thing on anybody's mind. So these are all infrastructures that we rely on. Um, I did not ring up the Irish Electricity Board yesterday and say, look, is there going to be electricity in Dublin on Saturday, uh, this Saturday in July? Because if there's no electricity in Dublin, my presentation's not going to work. Um, I doubt we'll have a really successful conference. I won't come. Okay, I I made as long as along with all of you the assumption that there would be electricity in the city of Dublin, uh, and it would work. And uh, these are other pieces of infrastructure that I rely on. And of course, you only really notice infrastructures when they fail. So this is Heathrow. 
um, in the snow. Um, uh, for my Finnish colleagues, this is extremely funny. Uh, so a very, very small amount of snow at Heathrow creates this sort of two-week scheduling disaster zone uh, uh, of knock-on effects, whereas Helsinki Airport will stay open throughout the Finnish winter with no problem at all. So there's obviously a difference in infrastructure provision of, uh, of how this works. This is a bridge up in America, and it's actually the only, it's a bridge, the town is split by this river, and the next bridge is 30 miles one way or 20 miles the other way. So this was an extremely annoying uh, infrastructure failure if you lived on one side and your children went to school on the other side of this. So we only really notice infrastructures when, when they fail. As someone who provides infrastructures, I can tell you, we do not get emails every morning saying, you know, I was looking for that DNA experiment that someone put away about a year and a half ago, and you know what? I got it straight from your website with no hassle at all. We just don't get those emails. We only get the emails saying, I cannot believe that you guys managed to not format your FASTQ files correctly uh, for, you know, format whatever. And then at the end of the very long help desk trail, it usually ends up saying, I don't think you've quite understood the format diversity that is FASTQ. Um, and uh, you have made a different assumption than the standard that we are currently using. For this, here is a useful tool uh, uh, for, you, for you to, to use. And infra information, what so our science now demands an information infrastructure. And these are all things from, from um, a selection of papers uh, where I've just picked out in red the infrastructure. Um, how many times have you read about go enrichment? How many times has a paper ended up with go enrichment? Nobody spends their time saying, to themselves, I wonder how does that go enrichment work? You know, who provides those nice go terms? And somebody must do some, it must be quite complicated there. No, they just, you know, they're just very, very happy figure four to come out with, uh, uh, with all of these different things. And this kind of infrastructure, as I, as I mentioned, sort of previous, touched on previously, is not something which is, you know, a lot of people think this is about kit and big data and, for example, a lot of DNA sequence. And that is true. There is an awful lot of need for DNA sequence storage. But it's, in fact, just as much about the small detailed things as it is about the big volume things. So, again, going to Helen's work, um, it is just keeping track of metadata at the scale that is going on is incredibly um, uh, important. And with uh, uh, across the board, we have to be able to provide the information um, that people are going to use. Again, if you read grant proposals, you'll be surprised at the assumptions that people make about what will be available in three years' time. I can tell you now that people do not phone me up and say, I'm putting in a grant. I think, you know, I think if everything's good, uh, we'll get it in about two and a half years' time. Could you tell me, is the human genome reference sequence still going to be around in two years' time, or do I need to, you know, work that out myself? You know, just as I made the assumption of electricity, the people who write grants make the assumption that these things are going to exist in two or three years' time. Um, we do have some interesting challenges. This is a plot that keeps not no longer me up, keeps Stephen Newhouse up at night, of time uh, on the x-axis versus log of the number of bytes on the y-axis here. Uh, so this is a, as this is a log scale, a straight line here is an exponential with a particular doubling time. And you can, uh, the key thing here is that we worry when the doubling time is below 18 months. Actually, between 12 and 18 months, you can sort of cope with it just about. Um, the stuff down here, which is a, a mass spec and metabolites, mass spec is going to become a problem um, uh, in terms of storage over the next uh, four or five years. But we do have this in hand. I'll come back a little bit to this. Okay. And as infrastructure providers, at EMBL EBI. In fact, the easiest thing to think about is the scaling in, in terms of data. We 
The thing that we don't see Emble EBI being able to scale out towards over the next 10 years is expertise. I do this example using COD genetics. So Emble EBI is close to one of the big academic centres in Europe, Cambridge University in the Cambridge, Cambridge, London area. I can walk out and I can find experts in Arabidopsis, I can find experts in cancer, I can find experts in all sorts. But I cannot find anybody of the top 100 pelagic fish genomicists in the Cambridge area. I can assure you, because I've tried, um, and uh, they don't uh, really like to hang out in Cambridge. Uh, there are not a lot of ocean-going fish uh, geneticists and genomicists in the fens of uh, Cambridge. However, if you go to Bergen uh, in Norway, uh, you walk down the corridor and walk past four or five of the top ten uh, experts in ocean-going fish genetics and genomics. And so it's kind of inevitable that um, if we can scale, if we want to scale our infrastructure to where it's going to have to go, which is across all of the living organisms and all of the systems inside of a human that we care about, we have to tap into the expertise actually across the entire world. The entire world is a big scale. We, uh, uh, Janet Thornton, some time uh, about now 10 years ago, realized this and started the process, which has led to Elixir, which is the European Infrastructure Project. And I'd like to notice that Carol is here, who is the head of the UK Elixir node. Deputy head. Deputy head, really? OK. You should be co-head, Ms. Carol. Joint, like me and Rob. Um, and this is our, the leader, uh, Nicholas Bloomberg, um, uh, uh, who heads up the Elixir network. And the goal here is, so in blue, this slide might be slightly out of date. So in blue are the countries that have signed the Elixir um, uh, Consortium Agreement, the ECA. It's quite interesting that countries sign, not institutions sign. This is a very sort of heavy process, but it also, as, as it should be for infrastructure, guarantees a lot of inertia in the system. And the light blue people are the people who have signed a memorandum of understanding, um, uh, so they're on the route to uh, joining. Have I missed a country here now? I think, I think Spain might be dark blue now. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and EMBL, as an international treaty organization, we're a bit of an odd fish in this crowd because we're not quite a country, um, but in effect, we are a transnational node to this. So in effect, we are like a like a country for this. Um, and so uh, uh, the goal of Elixir is to scale this infrastructure. And by scaling, I'm really talking about people. I mean, there is this business about scaling in terms of compute and in terms of hardware. But that problem is a problem mainly of making the argument correctly about the money that is related to that. That argument is well understood and doesn't really have the same scaling properties. The hard thing to scale about is expertise. Um, and this is our solution about scaling the expertise over this coming uh, decade. So now I would like to give you something fun. And apologies for people who have seen this talk before. I know some people have uh, uh, this part of the talk. And for other people, I think you'll hopefully enjoy it. So I want to go back to this slide here. Um, which is uh, uh, time on the x-axis and log of the number of bytes on the y-axis. I want you to focus at around 2008, 2009. This is DNA sequence, and this line here was doubling under every six months. All right. A colleague of mine, a mouse geneticist, wrote to do a DNA sequencing project. And he wrote to a sequence, I think it was 20 uh, mice. By the time he was awarded the grant, six months, nine months later, what he had written was, in fact, he, he could now do you know, considerably more. So he used half of his sequencing budget to do his grant and sequence 20 mice. And then six months later, he discovered that 
sequencing costs had dropped yet again, and he used half again of that remainder to do the whole experiment again. And six months later, he discovered that he could still do this uh, going forwards. Apparently, he had an, uh, um, uh, an infinite amount of consumables budget uh, uh, given time uh, for that uh, project. Now, at that time, um, people were getting extremely scared about whether we were going to be able to scale in terms of volume. And in terms of the EBI, we responded by understanding how to do reference-based compression. And if you haven't got your head around reference-based compression and you're not using CRAM, please go and do that. It will make your life and our life a lot better. But I got beaten up quite heavily by my colleagues at EMBL saying, give it up, Ewan. You're never going to be able to store all of this. And I said, no, 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 no. We can do this, do that. It was a very long, exhausting um, meeting. And my, my colleague at MLDBI, Nick Goldman, uh, took me out for a beer, basically, and we were joking around, and we said, you know, what we need is a really small, electricity-free, digital storage device. Um, a focus on the electricity-free, uh, but small would be nice as well. And, and we were doing, we are saying, wait, Nick said, wait a minute, second, I know a really, really small, uh, electricity-free digital nanomaterial, and it is, of course, DNA itself. So we think of DNA as the stuff inside of our bodies that programs our cells to do things that get read off and read out, but in many ways, DNA is just a lovely digital molecule. It's a polymer. It doesn't need any electricity to be kept. Um, it's incredibly small, um, and there's a remarkable toolkit for both reading and writing and manipulating DNA. So we were having our Hefeweizens in Hamburg and uh, we uh, uh, were joking around, uh, doing things on bits of paper. And by our second Hefeweizen, we thought, you know what, we could seriously do this. Um, and we realized at the time that we knew that people, you can order DNA up uh, of your own design. And this is the Agilent facility. There's, in fact, a number of different technologies that work for this, work in this, uh, which print DNA um, through what is basically a giant Gutenberg printer with chemicals. And so you can order your own DNA to your own design. So Nick and I realized, even at that very first pub, uh, or the, our very first Hefeweizens, that there were some trivial ways of mapping um, binary text to DNA sequence. Um, by the way, the reason why we use Lego is we've discovered that Lego is the easiest way to explain DNA to people who haven't met DNA. Uh, so we say that there are four different colors of Lego and they click onto each other. This is, this, is, this is the Lego analogy here. So you can think of some very trivial ways of going from a binary thing to a four base pair thing. Obviously, that you know two bits in a binary stream would go to one um, uh, letter, trivially. But that won't work. So there's a couple of reasons why that won't work. Firstly, you cannot make long bits of DNA. Um, so that's a very hard well, you can make, but it requires epic amounts of molecular biology. And then it breaks as soon as you put it in solution and you pipette it. So it's a big mistake to try and keep long bits of DNA around. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is that we realize that there are certain characteristic problems in both reading and writing DNA. And in particular, when you get repeated bases, so when it's AAAAA or TTTTT, in particular if that goes on for a long time, um, then there's going to be a problem in the DNA synthesis and in the DNA reading. So we came up with a coding system that takes the binary files and maps them to DNA sequence. Um, so in terms of fragments, I mean, it's kind of slightly obvious. So if you're a molecular biologist, you think about this as a PCR problem. If you're a computer scientist, you say to yourself, oh, this looks a bit like TCP IP packets. And I'm going to put a little uh, index on each one. And we do overlapping packets so that we, we can do error correcting here. And in fact, we reverse every second one. As it's gone on, uh, we've, Nick and I have learned all sorts of amazing things about how to do the coding right for this. 
uh, the disk drive industry is very interesting about this. So fountain codes, it's, it's really fun stuff. So we realized that we could do this. And then I, I rang up this uh, Agilent. I said, uh, you're a crazy Californian company. We have a crazy idea. Uh, would you make some DNA for us um, to our own design? And they said, uh, PS, we, and I said, PS, we don't have any money for this. Uh, and they said, yeah, we're crazy Californian kids. This is right up our street, sure. So then Nick and I had to choose um, for our first experiment, what would we store in DNA? So we stored this, which is a JPEG of a leading or the leading bioinformatics institute just south of Cambridge. You're all very, very welcome to visit. We stored this. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was too loud, Michael. <laughs> we stored this PDF, uh, which is the uh, structure of the double helix with the famous paragraph. It has not escaped our notice um, uh, that this um, structure implies, obviously implies a way of it being replicated. And we stored all of Shakespeare's sonnets. I wanted, or we wanted to go for the entire works of Shakespeare, uh, but then the Californian company would <coughs> wanted money. And so we, uh, we went back to just uh, all of Shakespeare's sonnets. Now, DNA is a remarkable uh, molecule. The oldest piece of DNA that we have sequenced is 750,000 years old. That is before modern humans evolved. It is trivial to sequence uh, DNA from 10,000 year old cave bears um, people in Cervante uh, Pavo's lab do this every single day. And the only thing you have to really ensure to get that length of time uh, storage is actually that it's dry, that it's kept away from moisture. The easiest way to make sure something is kept away from moisture for 10,000 years is for it to be in permafrost. So to be in somewhere below minus, about minus 10 degrees centigrade, where there is no moisture in the air because all the moisture has... has um, uh, frozen out of the air. Uh, after it being moisture free, the next most important thing actually is that it's dark um, and then probably that it's cold uh, uh, in those things. So uh, it is trivial to store DNA for a very long time. DNA is also incredibly dense. A rather small truck would store three zettabytes of information. That is the estimated information of the entire internet. Uh, in DNA. Uh, certainly this, this, tape, this space here is more than enough volume to store all the digital information in the world in DNA. Now obviously that would be impractical for two reasons. If you wanted to read any part of it, you would have to read all three zettabytes to index it. So you would have some kind of physical indexing system as they do with tape drives at the moment where you would split things up in some way. So you would not just have uh, two tons of DNA in a massive bucket. Uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, and the second problem is that all the money in the world uh, would have to go to the Californian company uh, to generate that amount of DNA. Um, and then there's some other interesting properties. So um, DNA, you can make a copy very, very cheaply. And that's very different from other digital media. When you talk about copying digital media, very often um, you, you copy um, by uh, um, taking two digital medias and then you rearrange the bits of one media to match the bits on the other media. That's what we mean by copy. The manufacture of those two bits of digital media is sort of independent and then you twiddle them. When we talk about copying DNA, you really mean making more of the same thing. 
Um, and that's a property that no other digital media um, has. It's quite interesting to think about. Now, um, this is, seems like science fiction, but in fact, that, so the big problem here is cost. Um, and we think we can get, not get around this, but we think we have a way to handle this. Um, and so this is, we hope, going to be a reality in a couple of years' time, or maybe five years' time or ten years' time, uh, of actually being able to reposition DNA as a digital storage device. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I now am, you know, I now no longer do any work. I give talks, I uh, inspire, I hope. Um, I, I try to make the right arguments to the right people. And uh, all that infrastructure that we all use all the time uh, comes from the 570 staff of Anvil EDI. And uh, many, many thanks to all of them. So you, as some of you realize, you can follow me on Twitter, you can follow Emble EDI on Twitter, uh, and you can read my blog. So thank you very much for listening.